Um, Ian's been a long-term uh, advocate for and participant in improving uh, education both in Australia and in New Zealand and we've been delighted to be able to partner with the Commonwealth Bank uh, on the toolkit work. I think the approach that the Commonwealth Bank has taken to thinking about their investment in community as being one which is about maintaining a workforce and a customer base which will maintain their shareholder value and profit growth over the next 25 to 40 years is, is extremely long-sighted, but actually incredibly important. Um, there's been many changes in rhetoric over the last couple of weeks uh, since, uh, since the dialogue has changed in Canberra. And one of them is, for the first time in a long time, people saying, actually, income per capita in Australia is going down. And if we don't do something about that, then we're actually all on a trajectory that we're not, uh, not going to be very happy about. Investments in education is a critical component of making sure that that, uh, that future is not one uh, that we pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Ian, delighted to have you with us. Looking forward to... Um, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Um, Uncle Alan, if he's still here, uh, I'd like to thank him for his very warm welcome um, and acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, and their elders, past and present, and other Indigenous Australians here today, and extend welcome to all of you, uh, Minister, and particularly also the uh, SVA team, uh, Rob and Paul and everybody else here. It's been a delight uh, to partner with SVA, uh, particularly on this topic, and it's a partnership I'll talk a bit about later. Uh, which is really core to the way we're thinking long term about the needs uh, of Australia. And I'll come back a bit later to the question of why we care. Um, but uh, I want to start uh, at the very outset of today. I've got, got an early start to the office. And my first task for the day uh, was I had a little bit of a backlog of retirement letters to sign. Uh, and they are letters that I sign for people who have retired after at least 15 years uh, of service with the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, and there are a lot of them. And the nice thing among many uh, familiar names there is that the letter always starts personalised to the date they started and to the job that they were in when they started. And so today I signed letters for people who had started as a customer service typist, uh, a post office clerk, a file clerk among these letters, those were three of the starting jobs that stuck out to me. Uh, one thing I can say about all the people who started in those jobs is by virtue of the fact that only now are they retiring, and the record for today was 53 years uh, in the organisation, so another retirement letter I have proudly signed for somebody who started at the bank before I was born. And they had successfully adapted between this starting job, which we have now for some time been obsolete in the Commonwealth Bank, and the job that they had immediately before retirement, which was in the case of all these people who are contributing wonderful experience, skills to uh, the Commonwealth Bank workforce, very different from the job they started in. Very different process of adaptation, and in their case, by definition, a successful process of adaptation. But juxtaposed with the event that I knew I was coming to speak to tonight, it really brought to me into sharp focus names, faces that I knew, careers that I know of, examples of this transition that the economy is making, where the jobs that are becoming available and will be available in the future for the graduates of our schools and the graduates of our universities are in many ways very different from the jobs that were available certainly a generation ago, and in many cases much less than a generation ago. And we're seeing, and Rob mentioned this in the last couple of weeks, a renewed dialogue about this, a renewed emphasis about this in some of the political rhetoric where front and centre the notions of innovation, an agile economy, a flexible economy, an agile workforce are getting increasing airtime. Now, many of you in this room, many of us in this room have been thinking about this concept of how the global economy works, technology, innovation, what it does to all our workplaces, what it does to the economy overall. We've given this a lot of thought. 
there is an enormous amount of jargon on the topic. There are enormous amount of people rehashing old ideas into new jargon and presenting them as new ideas. And the job of all of us is to sift through a lot of the platitudes, a lot of the slogans, and actually work out what is the fundamental change that is happening and what is the role for all of us as leaders of institutions and participants in, in institutions to prepare ourselves for that change and to affect that change. And the education system is front and center of that debate. Everybody can agree that in the economy that we are contemplating, in the economy that we are talking about, the education sector has an enormous role to play. What we're not sure everyone can agree on is what that role actually is, how it plays that role, and how different that role is from what has been done to date or in previous years. Now on that topic in this audience, uh, Rob has already uh, claimed for himself the title which I'll dispute of being the least interesting speaker of the night. What I can at least say is I'm the least qualified speaker tonight. And I want to be clear that in talking about our approach to this uh, from the Commonwealth Bank's perspective, we are not experts on education. And we will not purport to be experts on education. And in our role in working with schools, with principals, with teachers, with other players in the educational sector, we're not going to use our participation as a way to get some kind of philosophy in education through the education system. We're going to leave that to people who really understand the education system. The perspective that we can talk a little bit about is really, from my point, from, from two different angles. Number one is that we employ 50,000 people. We care about having good pipelines of capable people to continue working in the Commonwealth Bank. So that's perspective number one, and we have a few perspectives on what that might look like and how that might need to change. Perspective number two, and I really want to pick up on the point that Rob made about differential outcomes, because I've read the research not only about the discrepancies in outcomes across schools, but in discrepancies of outcomes within schools. And I could make the argument that as an employer, we only need 50,000 people at the moment out, out of about 25 million, so what do we really care about in equity? We'll still find the 50,000 people. But as citizens of the economy, as, a, as an institution which above all else depends for its success on Australia's success, we must care about equity in the education system. And we do care about equity in the education system. So our comments are without educational expertise, but they're very much made from the perspective of an employer and a concerned participant in Australia's future success, which depends to a very large extent on the success of its education system. So with ba that background and with those disclaimers, what are some of the things that we think about? And I do have only three points. I don't have the other seven. I might borrow a few of yours and rehash them. And they're really around three things. Number one is around the definition of what the basics are. Number two is about the broadening of the canvas to develop excellence. And then number three is around what we've already heard a bit about tonight, is around this collaboration between different players, teachers, principals, education academics, businesses, politicians, how we can all work together towards the outcomes that we're aspiring to. And I just want to say a couple of things on each of those topics. First of all, on the definition of the basics. What we believe at the Commonwealth Bank, based on our own experience, is that as the world evolves, and as we talk more about coding, and as we talk more about creativity, and as we talk more about agile, the basics that we've always talked about which are reading, writing, literacy, still matter. It absolutely still matters to us as an employer whether those basics exist. And so from our perspective, even as the world changes in terms of the outcomes that we need as an employer from the education system, the primacy of those basic skills 
remains as significant as it always has. But we would add a couple of different perspectives to that. Number one is that the definition of the basics has expanded somewhat. And there is no doubt that some level of understanding of technology, not necessarily at the coding level, I'll come back to that, but as to what the forces of technology are, how they may, might impact our lives, how we get to use technology, is now a foundational skill. And what worries me in the definition of that in the basics as a parent of young children, is that you can see that if we are going to define that as a foundational skill, then we have the risk that the gap between the have and the have nots will increase. Because the child that brings her or his own device to school, that gets to use a later state of the art device, that gets to download the most advanced educational apps for those devices, which are increasingly designed to let the child do what they want, sometimes for hours on end in a very constructive educational way, the differences between his or her educational experience and the educational experience of somebody who does not have the same opportunity may grow. And in defining this as a basic foundational skill, we need to be cognizant of that risk. The other area in which we believe the, the basics need to be thought about is financial literacy in our experience is a core foundational skill. <clears throat> understanding the value of money, understanding the concept of saving, understanding the concept of budgeting is a core life skill. And that's why we have invested so much in our own Start Smart program. And having put a million kids through that program are now committed to investing more in it. I'll come back to that towards the end. Finally, in terms of foundational skills, what we do want to emphasize as an employer is that it is absolutely critical to understand being a good human being as being a foundational skill. So many of the themes that we are trying to emphasize at executive level, good values, good integrity, gender neutrality, embracing people from different ethnic national backgrounds, embracing people who come from families of two dads or two mums, creating a work environment where you can thrive regardless of whether or not you have a disability. These go back to fundamental values and morals which we want to build in our children from the earliest age as possible, and we see that the schools have a role to play in that. So message number one is that the basics are as critical as ever. We just need to make sure we're broadening a little bit the definition of what those basics are. Theme number two is this canvas of excellence. So we've talked a little bit about what the basics are. We've then heard a lot about the fact that the economy is becoming increasingly global, and Australia is subject increasingly to global competitive pressures, which I think we can all now accept as an undeniable fact of the direction in which the world is going. Often the responses we hear to those sorts of things are, we're going to create an innovation hub, we're going to create a fintech hub, we're going to support startups, all of which are absolutely critical. But what I can say is just in the last six months or last year, I've had the pleasure through the needs of the bank to visit Hangzhou in China, the home of Alibaba, to visit Ho Chi Minh City where we've got some people doing some IT development within our Vietnam branch, branch of the Commonwealth Bank, to visit Johannesburg, to visit Tel Aviv, to visit the United States. They're all saying the same thing. They're all saying we need to create innovative communities. We need to create fintech. We need to create startups. This is not a unique idea. So the question comes down to how are we going to prepare ourselves in an environment where there is increasing global competition and everyone's onto the same themes. And the thought I'd like to, to seed among the educational experts here 
is the concept of making sure our children understand the range of potential options open to them to be great creative contributors to our community and to the future of the economy. We often say that in light of the changes in global competitiveness, the key skill we need is more coders. And in fact, we do need more coders. But an equal skill in this global economy is basic creativity, creative thinking. The creative thinking that sometimes comes from being an expert in learning English or in learning art history or having a passion for the performing arts and bringing that into the realm of what we can excel at. And seeing that kind of collaboration from people in different disciplines is extremely important. It's also very important that for an economy which will attract foreign investment, foreign immigrants, people who want their children educated here and visitors, that we're preparing people in our schools to excel in the disciplines on which a strong service economy can thrive. So point number two is to make sure that in defining excellence, in defining the things we want to excel at in this new world, we don't limit ourselves too much to these new skills of coding, entrepreneurialism, etc., which are important, but which are only a small part of the big picture. And finally, on the last point, the collaboration. And what I think the essence of the dialogue is here tonight, and why we're so excited to be part of it, and be part of the partnership that we have generally with ESVA. One of the great challenges in education is everybody has an opinion. And it often starts with, I know I'm not an educational expert, but when I was at school, or, but I am a parent, and this is what I observe, and we're committing the exact sin that our marketing departments tell us never to commit, which is assume you are the market. Assuming your own experience is actually exemplary of what the entire answer is. And if we don't allow that in business, we shouldn't be allowing it in education. And so our approach inside the Commonwealth Bank is very much one of partnership, where we understand what we think we can add, which is in the areas of financial literacy, in the areas of our reach into Australian schools, and we partner with people who are doing that extremely well. And I want to emphasise here that for all the legitimate and very important public debate about ensuring high levels of teacher quality, high levels of capability in pedagogy in the schools, what we see through our lens is that there are many, many outstanding men and women already doing this job in Australian schools at the level it needs to be done to have exceptional outcomes. And part of our approach is to work more closely with those people and to help them as the real experts in delivering where we can be helpful. So it's very important that this broad area of partnership and ecosystem that we're all building has a structure and it's designed around the basic principle that the outstanding outcomes will be achieved by terrific school, sk schools run by outstanding principals leading strong teachers. And it can often be the simplest things. One of the most poignant experience I've had in uh, my spare time, I have been involved in the last 10 years as an, in a non-profit New Zealand which works with principals of low decile schools. And I was helping introduce a business to a school which wanted some help. And the business had this long list of ideas on how it could help the school. And the principal said, I'm not, not interested in any of these things. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to provide 10 male executives to come to the school at lunchtime with a book and read the book. And the response was, you mean read the book to the children? And they said, no, read the book. And the whole idea of it in this school in a very difficult part of South Auckland, was young kids could see that grown men actually sit down and read. Now, we would never have thought of that in all our genius in our ivory tower trying to work out how to support the education sector. But it's absolutely critical that this broad ecosystem, the kind of things that the SVA is leading, are all structured around 
the most important delivery mechanism for great educational outcomes, which is the schools. And on that note, I finish on a positive point, which is our view on this topic is one of the great strengths of Australia is the ability to bring the key stakeholders all together in a relatively small room. We're an economy with the scale to actually do great things, but the intimacy to actually bring leaders from different sectors together to think together. And I think if we can keep doing that, and if we can role model outside the day or two days of the dialogue, what the SVA is trying to create here, then the outlook for education in Australia and therefore for the economy in Australia is very rosy. Thank you again for the invitation and enjoy the evening.